So it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ian Anderson, who's going to give the uh, second lecture of his series on mm -hmm. symmetries, conservation laws, and variational principles. Please. Okay. Thank you, Katya. Thank you, Dennis. In the first talk, we talked about symmetries of differential equations. And we talked about the different kinds, internal symmetries, external, and generalized symmetries. We gave examples of, of, of each, and, and we established some relationships between these different concepts of symmetries. The takeaway might be from, for today, from last lecture for today was that if we had a system of differential equations, which I always kind of will denote by delta, some function of the independent variables x, the dependent variables u, their partial derivatives, and so on. Then we introduced the idea of the linearization of L as kind of a formal differential operator, d by delta du alpha. Let me rewrite that part linearization of delta is this. And so way to think about this is, is this is exactly the linearization of a differential operator that you might learn in a, a, a applied math class. If we fix a solution to u, then this is a linear differential equation for v. And the idea is that the first order u plus u naught plus t times v alpha will be another solution to our system of differential equations. So this linearization operator will show up again when we talk about conservation laws. So the topics we have for today are first integrals of ODEs, classical conservation laws, lower degree conservation laws, examples, um, characteristic Lagrangians, conservation laws and relativity. And uh, I think that's about the topics that we'll, we'll get through, through today. So the very first kind of conservation law that one learns about is uh, first integrals of ordinary differential equations. So I'll, I'll write my first order system of differential equations this way. Here's my first order system, second order system of, of differential equations. I'll use dots to stand for derivatives now. And then a function of x, u, and the first derivative of u is called a first integral of this differential equation if it, the total derivative of i with respect to x, and I've written know what that is, that's partial i partial x partial i times u times u dot plus partial i times u double dot. So this is a u double dot right here, but u double dot is equal to uh, f. So this is a scalar. So given, given f, this is a scalar partial differential equation in two m plus one variables. So you can just automatically infer from the existence theory for linear uh, partial differential equations that it will be 2m um, in functionally independent solutions. So we know how many conservation, how many first integrals an ordinary differential equation will have. However, finding all of those first integrals is essentially equivalent to solving the differential equation. A very famous example that goes back over a century was it is uh, the three body problem. So you have three particles with different masses and they're moving under the, their mutual gravitational influence. This was a very famous dynamical systems problem. And people wanted to, it was a big prize, a very famous prize uh, to be awarded for someone who could solve this problem. Uh, there's a, called Brun's theorem. And this theorem says that the only algebra, so-called algebraic first integrals, you can think of this as being functions which are rational functions of uh, velocity, of uh, position and, and momentum. So the only algebraic first integrals for the three body problem 
are the well-known ones of energy, linear momentum, and angular momentum. Uh, I was reading up while well, I was preparing for the talk a little bit on the history of this, and it seems that Brun's proof was, was a little bit incomplete, and, and that Poincaré uh, filled in some of the details uh, using what I, I would call sort of a non-standard technique. He said, well, I know lots of solutions to the three-body problem, and from the existence of different kinds of solutions, I can infer that there aren't so many first integrals. So we usually like to think of the problem going in the opposite direction. It would be interesting to know if there was still sort of a purely algebraic differential proof of, of this theorem that doesn't use uh, knowledge about uh, the solutions to the equations. Next example that's well known to many, most of us, I think, are the geodesic equations. So we have a, a metric, gij. From the metric, we can build the Krastoffel symbols. And then we can write down the geodesic equation. This geodesic equation gives you the path of shortest distance between two points on your space. And here, one wants to look for, since this differential equation is polynomial in derivatives, what we can look for homogeneous polynomial first integrals. So that will be functions of uh, some function of u multiplied by uh, first derivatives. Okay. And if we have k, you might have here k first derivatives. Okay. And uh, it's well known that finding first integrals for the geodesic equation is equivalent to finding Killing tensors of different ranks. So here's the Killing equation. The covariant derivative of this tensor I symmetrized equals zero. Solving this equation is equivalent to finding first integrals of the geodesic equations. There seems to be only a few metrics for which all the Killing tensors, by all I mean Killing tensors at all ranks are known. Okay. So I've been working with a student on the problem of calculating killing tensors. And we've done a lot of, as you might guess, maple experiments. And by virtue of these maple experiments, we've produced metrics with uh, large gaps. That is to say, there's no killing tensors at, uh, at order two, no killing tensors at order, or new killing tensors or irreducible killing tensors at order three. Then all of a sudden, somewhere up at order 10, you get a new irreducible uh, killing tensor. So the construction of such examples is not so hard. What is tricky is to prove that these are exactly the only killing tensors that there are of every possible order. So that's something that we've been working on. We should have some results in this area pretty to, to publish pretty soon. So <clears throat> classically, so let's move on to co conservation laws for partial differential equations. So again, we have some system of differential equations delta, and here I've written it as, as uh, I should keep this as delta A. And so uh, a conservation law is a vector it, it, whose coefficients depend upon the independent dependent variables and their derivatives to some order. And that vector field should have zero divergence. So we calculate the divergence of this. Again, here, this is the total derivative operator. So it's like what we had on the last slide. And we want the divergence to be zero modulo the equation and its derivatives. <clears throat> These vector fields are called conservation laws in the, in, in the sense that, uh, well, there's a couple of different ways one can think about this, but one way is to think of a, a surface. Here's our, our manifold or our space of independent variables. And if we take two closed surfaces uh, on, uh, on this manifold, then uh, the amount of stuff 
given by the vector field V. So I've drawn in here the vector field E. The amount of stuff flowing into this region is equal to the amount of stuff by the divergence theorem. Uh, the amount of stuff flowing into the region equals the amount of stuff flowing out of the region. And so that's why it's called a, a conservation law. Something that we didn't see in symmetries. So when we're calculating symmetries, we, we didn't really have to deal too much about this equivalence issue, but it's very important here. We're going to call two vector fields equivalent. There's two kinds of equivalence one has to worry about. Uh, the first is if you have two vector fields and they're uh, uh, and they differ and they're uh, equal to zero modulo the equation and its derivatives, then we would call those two vector fields equivalent conservation laws. Also, we have to worry about the following. Maybe we have two vector fields, V1 and V2, and we calculate their difference. And that difference is not zero, but it's actually the divergence of a rank two anti-symmetric tensor. Then if I take the divergence of this equation, I'll get di dj, wij. I said that w is skew symmetric. These partial derivative operators commute. And so this turns out to be, to be zero. So we have two notions of equivalence of conservation laws. And so when we're listing all possible conservation laws, we really mean it's modulo these equivalence relations. And what these two relations do, they simply tell you that the integral over a hypersurface of conservation law one or vector field one is equal to the integral over the hypersurface two on, on solution. So they're measuring exactly the same amount of stuff. Okay, so the question is how to find them. And, and unlike symmetries, this is a little bit of a longer, longer story. And so uh, in order to tell this story, I need to introduce a little, something called the Euler operators. So the Euler operators, they sort of appear anytime they appear in the variational calculus. Anytime you're doing classical field theory and calculus of variations, almost surely you're going to hit upon these operators. They show up in many places, as, I, as I'm about to show. So the first Euler operator is the classical Euler-Lagrange operator. Partial derivative of f with respect to u minus the total derivative of the first derivative plus second total derivatives of the second of f with respect to the second derivatives of the dependent variables. So I think this is the one that's well known to most of us. But the higher Euler operators, you kind of just erase one of these derivatives off of the Euler-Lagrange operator. So it starts with this term. The next term is this one with a single derivative. The next, if I had put a third order term in here, I would now get the following for the first Euler operator. So this is the classical Euler-Lagrange operator. I'd call this one the first higher order Euler operator. And here's the second one. Unhook a derivative from this and start with the second derivatives, then one total derivative of the third derivatives, and then two total derivatives of the fourth derivatives and so on. Okay. And then these binomial coefficients show up in these formulas as well. Okay. So as I just sort of already indicated, these operators, excuse me for one minute.
these operators appear throughout the variational calculus. In the first place they show up, and that this will be impo very important to us, is the following context. So we've already talked about the linearization. Here I'm using the function g. So I have my differential operator L. I can calculate its linearization. And from that linearization, I can ask, well, this linearization is a linear operator. I can ask for the adjoint operator. And the adjoint operator is, is, is defined this way. It's h times the derivative or linearization of g minus g times the linearization of h. And you want this expression to be a total that to be a, uh, a divergence of some expression. I'll just, I, yeah, I'll just write it that way. And uh, there's a well-known formula for this uh, adjoint of a, uh, a differential operator. And here it is right here. Okay. The coefficients of the adjoint operator are given by the higher Euler, Euler operators applied to the original operator. So if we had a first order operator, if we just had uh, something like um, d delta du times g plus d delta dux times gx, you multiply that by h and you start integrating this term by parts, you're going to arrive at this formula right here. And the coefficient for this is going to be the Euler-Grange operator of delta. So the Euler operators appear whenever you want to calculate an adjoint of a linear differential operator. Two, <clears throat> the more was well known that if you have a divergence operator or an expression which is a total derivative, then the Euler-Grange operator of that is zero. But what happens if you have something which is a double derivative or something which is a, which is a triple derivative? Or put it the other way, you have a function and you wanted to test, you want to test to see if it can be written as a, a double total derivative, or you have a function f that you want to see if it's a triple total derivative. Well, here are the necessary and sufficient conditions for that to happen. It's a total derivative if the Euler operator is zero. It's a double derivative if the Euler operator and the first Euler operator are zero. And it's a triple total derivative if the first three sets of Euler operators are zero. <clears throat> I've talked in this seminar before about the inverse problem to the calculus of variations. So you have some uh, operator, and as yes, you have a Lagrangian, you calculate its Euler Lagrange expressions, call that delta alpha. And now you want to know uh, what are the necessary conditions for this delta to come from a variational principle. Well, here they are right here. They're expressed in terms of the derivatives of delta and the Euler operators of delta. So there's a system of equations. This has to be true for all uh, i equals 0, 1, 2. So for the first derivatives, the second derivatives, the third derivatives, all the derivatives appearing in delta, you have to check these conditions. They're, they're called the Helmholtz conditions. But wait a minute. We just said that. Uh, the lin these coefficients here determine the linearization of delta, and these coefficients here determine the um, adjoint operator of delta. And so one very nice way of, of stating the Helmholtz conditions succinctly is to say that if you have an operator which is Euler-Lagrange operator, then its linearization is self-adjoint. So this will show up again, what we're going to talk about later on. So operators which are variational, their linearizations are self-adjoint. The next property of the Euler operators that, we, that we'll want to use today is sort of called the product rule. How do you calculate the Euler-Lagrange operator of a product of two Lagrangians, say, so f times g? Well, the formula goes like this. It's the total derivatives of f times the corresponding Euler operators 
plus the total derivatives of G times the, sorry, say that again, it's the total derivatives of F times the Euler operators of G plus the total derivatives of G times the Euler operators of F. Okay. So we have four, three properties of Euler operators that we'll want to use this divergence property, this Helmholtz conditions, and this product rule. So here are the steps, how to find conservation laws. So here are the steps. And let me put in, insert in the word here, classical conservation laws. Okay. So we're given delta. So we're given delta and we wanna find V such that. derivatives of delta, okay? So the first thing we did, and we did this for concert when we were doing symmetries, is, is we turn this mod delta and mod the derivatives of delta into an equation, okay? So I can say that this vector field is zero, if and only if it's di this divergence is zero, if and only if it can be written as a function times delta plus a, um, more functions times the derivatives plus other functions times the second derivative. This is a pretty weak uh, uh, requirement that this is equivalent to this. Okay, so the next now step two is we're gonna get, we're gonna use our notion of equivalence and do the following. We're gonna take this term right here. We're gonna look at this term right here. And we're gonna take this I derivative and pull it out front. So we're gonna sort of integrate this term by parts. And we'll put, so we'll write this as the derivative of rho times the first derivative of the delta. And now we've got to subtract off this term right here. Okay, so now I'll take this expression and substitute it into here. This term stays the same. This term gets modified by this amount. And this term gets used to modify my vector field. So this is a derivative. So I can re pull this term into here and pull uh, this term into here. So I've gotten rid of, and now I have a new vector field whose divergence is equal to this. And this vector field is equivalent to my original vector field because it differs by something which is zero modulo of the equation. So I really haven't changed my conservation law. Okay. So now we're gonna go again. I've taken my original equation and I've integrated by parts once to get this. I'll integrate by parts again and move this into here and move piece of it into here. And now I have my uh, equation for my vector field looking like this. We can always, we can always, so we can say for any conservation law which satisfies this equation, there's an equivalent conservation which satisfies this much simpler equation. Okay. It's hopeless. Try to solve for V. So unlike the case of, of first integrals for ODE, where you directly solve for the first integral, here you can't solve, try and solve for this because you can all because this operator has a large kernel. You can always change whatever your um, conservation law is by adding in the divergence of a, a skew symmetric tensor. So because of this big kernel, we're never gonna be able to solve this equation directly for the vector field we want. What we're going to do is we're gonna go for this term right here and try and solve for, we're given delta, we're gonna try and solve for rho, okay? So that will be step three. How do we get a, an equation for rho? 
Okay, so what we're gonna do here is here's our equation. I've dropped the tildes. This is our start, our new starting point. Every classical conservation law for a system of differential equations satisfies an equation of this type. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply the Euler-Lagrange operator to both sides. Okay, so we'll apply the Euler-Lagrange operator to the left-hand side. Well, that's the Euler-Lagrange operator of divergence. That gives me zero. And haha, -ha, very interesting. On this side, we have the Euler-Lagrange operator of rho times delta, but I just said there's a very handy product rule for the Euler-Lagrange operator of a product, and I've written it down here. It's the Euler-Lagrange operators on delta, uh, on rho, times the Euler-Lagrange operators on the equation, plus the similar term over here. But if we calculate modulo the equation, so that's the next step. So step four is restrict this to the equation. So working modulo the equation, here are all the total derivative terms. They all drop out and I'm left with this equation right here. Okay. And so the defining equation now for conservation law is the adjoint of the linearization applied to some functions rho equals zero. So for symmetries, we had this equation, maybe I'll call it chi equals zero. For conservation laws, we have a similar equation only with the adjoint operator instead of the original operator. So sometimes people will, will, will say, oh, uh, because of this, uh, conservation laws are co-symmetries is a word that you'll sometimes, the expression you'll sometimes hear, but I wouldn't use that today. Okay, so solving the, the um, solving this equation for the adjoint equation is pretty much the same problem as calculating symmetry. So if you've written a good computer program for calculating uh, generalized symmetries, then you have at your disposal a good computer program, just change the operator for uh, um, calculating conservation laws. So this we can do. Can we do it in all orders? Well, sometimes, but certainly if we keep rho to be of low order. So if rho is of order less than if rho is of order less than the order of the differential equation, then th these kinds of equations are quite easy to, to solve, even writing it out by pencil and paper. Okay. But now there's a difference because we have to come back to our original equation. So now we've calculated a rho, but the, which satisfies this equation, but this equation does not imply that the divergence of this expression will be zero. So you take all the solutions that you found for rho, and you've got to re, uh, you've got to restrict those solutions by the further requirement that the Euler-Lagrange expression uh, of rho times delta is identically zero. Identically zero. So put it another way, this is an equation which is, which we which we solve this equation modulo the equations. But now we have to have this true sort of modulo nothing. We've got to have that equation being identically true. Okay. And then from that, you can use a, a homotopy operator from the variational bicomplex or a quadrature if necessary, necessary, or by quadratures, you can then calculate from your row, you can then calculate a representative conservation law. Okay, so those are the four four, seven steps I've listed for calculating conservation laws. You start with this general equation, you simplify it down to this, you then eliminate the vector field by taking the Euler-Lagrange expressions of both sides, you then get to the adjoint equation, you solve the adjoint equation, impose this step six, and then do a quadrature to find conservation laws. So already the takeaway at this point is, well, calculating conservation laws is a bit more involved than symmetries. 
Here's a simple example. Okay, I just picked this example to illustrate one point. I took a simple linear equation, ut equals u triple prime of x. Okay. Here's the linearized operator right here. So I multiply both sides by row, integrate by parts, and I get the adjoint operator, operator right like this. So in this case, it's this operator is not symmetric. You might call this, or an anti, this is not an Euler Lagrange operator because the linearization is not self adjoint, it's kind of skew adjoint. So, a lot of what one can say about Noether's theorem, as we'll talk about it later on, applies not only to symmetric oper, oper, not only to operators which are whose adjoint is symmetric, but also to operators whose adjoint is skew symmetric. Well, this equation right here is basically the same as the linear equation I started with. So I can immediately say that u, ux, ux, uxx, and so on. These are all solutions to the adjoint equation equals zero. Okay. But as I said, we're not done. We have to calculate, we have to take each one of these solutions. Let me take the u, okay. take u, Multiply it by the equation, compute the Euler Lagrange equation by varying u. And in this case, you get zero. So this one is, we'll give you a conservation law. If we take ux, multiply ux by the equation, calculate the Euler Lagrange expression of this, this is not zero. So even though ux solves the adjoint equation, ux will not give us a conservation law. So we got to scrap that one. Uxx, its Euler Lagrange equation is zero. So we can use this one to find a conservation law. And, and so on. So it turns out that the odd ones give in the odd solutions, the powers that are the ones which are odd derivatives, uh, will give us conservation laws. The ones, sorry, I got that backwards. The odd ones will not. The, e, yeah, the odd ones won't work, the even ones will work. We're constructing conservation laws. Finally, then once you've cap, got the V's that work, you have to, the U's or the rows that work, you have to come back and calculate the corresponding V's. And here's a, a simple example. So here's a V. If I take its divergence, the time, der, the derivative, the T derivative of this is UT the x derivative of this is this expression right here. You expand all this out and it factors into u times ut minus u triple x. And so this vector field right here is the conservation law corresponding to that solution of the adjoint equation. Okay, so the next topic is lower degree conservation laws. So this is something that's not quite as familiar to people as classical conservation laws. So we've said that in order to calculate a conservation law for a system of different equations, we have to solve this equation. The divergence of a vector field is zero modulo of the equation. But I think as everyone here knows, I can rewrite the divergence, the expression of a divergence of a vector field. I can turn that vector field into a n minus one form and then turn this equation, not into a divergence equation, but into this operator here. This is the total exterior derivative expression. So now, so now, the question here, the classical conservation laws are the following. Can you find a n minus one form whose total derivative or total exterior derivative is equal to zero modulo of equations? Well, once you realize that 
calculating conservation loss is like calculating closed n minus one forms, it's pretty natural to ask, are there any lower degree conservation laws? So conservation laws of degree less than or equal to n minus two. Okay. So at this point, I might kind of want to draw a little picture here. Oops. Okay. Might kind of think of our variational bi complex, which we, we talked about a while ago. Can be kind of useful for us. So, so this is on, we have our jet space of our dependent and independent variables. And we have two kinds of exterior derivative it splits into D equals DV, DH plus DV. And <clears throat> the number of boxes are, I have down here is N. And right in here, these are the N minus one forms. Uh, it, on the independent variables uh, with coefficients depending upon jets. And so this is the space in the variational bi-complex corresponding to classical conservation laws. And then this stuff down here, our lower degree conservation laws. So let's, <clears throat> let's see if we, can, if we can repeat the theory that we've just used for calculating classical conservation laws, see if we can apply that theory to finding lower degree ones. Okay, so we're gonna start with, uh, I guess I called it a, an R, R form. And now we're gonna take the total exterior derivative of our R form, and we want it to be equal to, well, but, but by what we did right here, we should just make it a multiple of our differential equations where the coefficients, the coefficients here were functions before, but now these coefficients here are going to be r plus one forms. Well, you might think that this is the equation you would solve for calculating lower degree conservation laws, but this is wrong. And it's wrong because if we go back to our very first step, we would say, okay, start with a uh, R form, take its exterior derivative. It should be zero modulo the equation and its derivatives where these here are form R forms. And what did we do before? Well, before we just said, well, we can integrate this by parts. Well, you can integrate this expression by parts, but that won't help because you've got to write, try and write this expression as a uh, as the exterior derivative of, you've got to rewrite this R plus one form as the exterior derivative of some R form, and you can't do that. So all your, so you're stuck right at the beginning. If you want to calculate lower degree conservation laws, you're stuck with keeping all these terms in. Okay, so the problem on the face of things looks, it looks a lot worse. Because you've got, instead of determining just these coefficients, you've got to somehow now determine this whole string of, of coefficients. <laughs> And so what I want to do now is show you how to do that. Okay. And there is a, a technical step here, which will make, uh, which makes all the calculations simpler. And it's the following. We've, we've talked about the linearization already. So I have a differential operator here. I've assumed the operators of second order and I've written down the linearization. Okay, and so now what I'm going to introduce is what's called a linearized lower degree conservation law. So it's omega. This is a, a, a differential R form. So this is an R form. If I write it out in detail, it's linear in 
v and its derivatives. And the coefficients here, these coefficients are R forms uh, uh, with, with jet coefficient dependencies. Okay. If we had a lower degree conservation law and I took the linearization of that linear, of that lower degree conservation law, I'd get a linearized expression like this. Okay. Again, if we're thinking about this in terms of the variation of bi-complex, this process of linearization is essentially taking the so-called vertical derivative in the bi-complex. And so what I'm saying here is the following. Instead of computing lower degree conservation laws along this edge, I'm gonna calculate lower degree conservation laws here and then worry later on if I find one, a lower degree conservation law here, I'll worry later on about whether I can pull it back to a conservation law on the edge. Okay, here, here's the dilemma that drives this whole thing and it's not too hard. So we have our equation right here for our, our linearized conservation law. When I was doing ordinary conservation laws, di of bi equals rho a times delta, I wiped out this side by applying the Euler-Grange operator. Now I'll wipe out this side by taking d, by taking a, an exterior derivative. And I'll write out the exterior derivative of this. So when I'm working in this calculation, I'm kind of in hybrid mode, I'm gonna work modulo the equation. So the coefficients here all depend upon the um, uh, U and its derivatives. And I'm gonna work with coefficients modulo the equations, but I'm gonna treat this as an identity in the linearized variables U. <clears throat> and when you do that, you come to the following very interesting equation. Okay. So if I have a lower, degree linearized conservation law, then this top coefficient is constrained by an algebraic identity. Okay. It says, take this coefficient, multiply it by dx, multiply it by this term right here. That term came from, that's the, the symbol of my differential operator. That's the highest order terms in my differential operator symmetrize the whole mass and set it equal to zero. So it's pretty amazing. You have a large syst system of linear equations on this highest order coefficient for, there to be, for it to be the coefficient of a lower degree conservation law. Okay. <clears throat> for reasons I'll, I'll mention briefly, this is called the algebraic Spencer equation for the linearized conservation law. There are trivial solutions to this, namely if rho uh, itself is a sem is, is rho itself, which was an r plus one form, if this is equal to some r form times dx, symmetry. So if this is true, then you can take this term in the defining relations uh, for the lower degree conservation law and, and integrate it by parts. So what I'm saying is going back to our original equation right here, there's an algebraic condition on this, these coefficients. I'm gonna try and there's a, these, a certain form of these coefficients always satisfy that algebraic condition. And if that special form is the only form then you can take this term and integrate it by parts and absorb this term into lower order terms and that term right there. So you can do what we did for classical conservation laws. Okay. And that's what I'm saying here. If the only solutions to this algebraic Spencer, Spencer equation are the trivial solutions, then there are no lower degree conservation laws. Okay, so what is Spencer cohomology? Well, that's a, a story for, for another day. It's essentially Durham cohomology uh, with polynomial coefficients. 
and those polynomial co coefficients are uh, assumed to be solutions to a linear PDE, typically the linear PDE given by the symbol of the equation. And so uh, one can establish some relationship between ordinary Spencer cohomology and this kind of dual version uh, of the equation that we have to solve here. It's not exactly Spencer cohomology, but it's very similar to it. And one can construct uh, long exact sequences relating the two different kinds of co Spencer cohomology. So here I always, whenever I'm talking on this, I like to quote from the Bryant Griffiths paper on char characteristic cohomology. Characteristic cohomology, uh, as described in this Bryant Griffiths paper, is just uh, exterior differential system version or formulation of calculating conservation laws. And they write in their paper, not knowing what Spencer cohomology is and what the Spencer co complex is, one is naturally led to these concepts once one agrees to study the characteristic cohomology. And for that, I mean lower degree conservation laws. of differential equations. So this Spencer cohomology is a pu purely algebraic construction. And if you know that Spencer cohomology, then you can determine uh, whether or not you have any lower, or you take the first step in determining whether or not you have any lower degree conservation laws. OK, so uh, in a paper I, I was working on with Charlie Torrey, we wrote out exactly what the, the details of all of this. So suppose we have a uh, differential form. Its total exterior derivative is this, no higher degree terms. In other words, the terms involving the derivatives of the linearizations have been killed off by virtue of the fact that there's no cohomology for this generalized Spencer equations, for these Spencer equations. So assuming you've killed off all higher order terms, then rho has to satisfy this algebraic condition and two other differential conditions. If, rho sat if you can find a rho which satisfies all these equations, then here's a closed form formula for what the lower degree conservation law looks like. I've written here, I've written here H in place of, of V. So let me put that back there. V. Okay. So solve the Spencer equations or their, their the algebraic Spencer equations that we need. Reduce the formula for the lower degree conservation law to this. Then if you can solve all of these equations, then there's exactly what the con lower degree conservation law must look like. Okay. So I've got some examples for, to, to, to work out. I think they're in the next no, no, no book. Okay, so here's examples of lower degree conservation laws. Well, let's take uh, for our differential equation, Laplace's equation. Okay, we want to find a form such that d omega is rho times delta plus rho i times delta i and so on. The first step is to satisfy, you have to satisfy this equation. You have to find the forms rho such that rho wedge dxi wedge or times the symbol of the equation fully symmetrized is equal to zero. So an easy tensor calculation shows you that, the, that this equation forces this piece to be zero. Then an easy differential forms calculation shows you that this thing this symmetrized derivative is zero if and only if the rows actually contain factor out of dx. So when I take this row, multiply by another dxj and symmetrize that whole thing, for sure I'm going to get zero because I'm symmetrizing across two indices in these forms. But wait a minute, this is exactly what the trivial um, uh, solutions to the Spencer equation are. So here's my Spencer equation and I solve it and I find that the only solutions are the trivial solutions. And that tells me there are no lower degree conservation laws. So this is a special case 
of the so-called Vinogradov two-line theorem, saying that there's no cohomology, no lower degree conservation law. So two lines is referring to the variational bicomplex, and we're saying that the only place where you can get cohomology is in these last two lines. There's no lower degree conservation laws, no cohomology in the variational bicomplex for that differential equation. So this is, since Laplace's equation is a, a typical example of a, of a differential equation with sort of a well-behaved symbol, we can say if you have a, a well-behaved symbol for your differential operator, then there will be no lower degree conservation laws. Okay. So let's try the next example, it's Maxwell's equations. So I've written Maxwell's equations in their classical form. Uh, divergence of E, divergence of B, curl of E, and curl of B. One can go through the theory that I just talked about and show that for Maxwell's equations, so we're in four dimensions here, X, Y, Z, and T are our independent variables. Uh, you can go through the theory that we just talked about and find that there are no degree one conservation laws. Let's look for degree two conservation laws. Okay. So uh, I'm going to look for, to just make this as simple as possible, I'm going to look for a conservation law. So it's a two form. And I'm just going to uh, ask that this two form depend linearly on the dependent variables E and B. Okay. Then I'm going to calculate the exterior derivative of that and demand that that exterior derivative be uh, a scalar times a lambda times the divergence, mu times the divergence, where these now are all three forms. So this is a two form. So these coefficients here are all three forms. And I'm gonna take this equation, I'm gonna take d squared of it, and I'm gonna find out what all these coefficients can possibly be. And I find out that there are two form conservation laws for Maxwell's equations, namely the ones that everyone knows, that this two form must be given by uh, F plus the dual of F, where F is this famous formula, which allows you to write Maxwell's equations in tensorial form. So if you didn't know about Maxwell's equations, so the takeaway here, if you didn't know that Maxwell's equations look like Fij bar J equals zero and Fij bar K semi-trice derivative equals zero. If you didn't know this tensor version of Maxwell's equations, and someone showed you this, we said, well, where did this come from? Well, you can just calculate, you can get to this simply by taking the classical version of, of Maxwell's equations and asking if there are two form conservation laws and you immediately discover this form right here. Okay, next example are the Einstein equations, okay? So gij equals zero, the vacuum Einstein equations, plug in to that formula that I, I gave, described earlier for lower degree conservation law. So this will be a two form conservation law. So we're taking Einstein equations in four dimensions, plug into that normal form that I gave, and it turns out to be this beautiful expression in, uh, in terms of the uh, a vector field X uh, and uh, a solution to the linearized equation. So if uh, I take the exterior derivative of this, it'll be zero if the Einstein equations hold, if the linearized Einstein equations hold, and if this killing vector is equal to zero, if X is a, a killing vector. This formula has lots of other interesting properties. It's invariant under sort of gauging the solution to the linearized equation. And in general relativity, there are no exact lower degree conservation laws. But if, if X, if, you, if your space is, is, if you have a, 
space time and it's sort of got a lot of curvature in here but as you go to infinity the space is becoming what's called asymptotically flat then you can use this formula here in the right coordinates. It's a delicate problem to get the coordinates right, but in the right coordinates, this formula gives you well-known ADM energy, it gives you the mass and the angular, you can get the mass and angular and uh, um, momentum of the Kerr metric out of, out of this formula. So this is a manifestly covariant formula. Um, valid for the Einstein equations. If you massage this enough, you can, you can recover all the various asymptotic conservation laws in general relativity. Uh, Dr. Torrey, my friend Charlie Torrey, has been working with this formula not in, and, and studying what it becomes, not when the space is an, asymptotically flat, but when it's asymptotically anti sitter and so on. So this is a starting point for a lot of work on asymptotic conservation laws in relativity theory. You can generalize this formula also to include matter fields. And I wanna again stress that this doesn't use Noether's theorem or Lagrangian formulation or anything. You just plug into those Spencer equations and out will pop this solution, this form which you can use to study conservation laws in relativity. Here's a, another example. I think it's my last, yeah. My last one. Uh, I want to take a system of vector fields, the xi plus, uh, I'll put them in this special form, plus ui, where u is a function of, uh, this should have been, just one minute. Yeah, I'll take a system of vector fields, calculate their brackets. Ah, sorry, this should be, this, this is dy. Okay, so the vector fields are, are partial derivatives with respect to x plus ui, which is a function of x, y, and x times partial y. Okay, so I've taken a, a vector field system and I've put it into this standard form. Okay, and now the equations I'm gonna study are the integrability conditions for this. So if you take the brackets of these two vector fields, it comes out to be something purely involving partial y. And then these are expressions involving the derivatives of u. And this is the system of differential equations I want, I want to study, okay? So here's uh, a lower degree conservation law. I'm gonna define alpha to be sort of the dual to this, this form here. And I'm going to take mu to be just ui times uj times dxj. And I'm going to calculate out the exterior derivative of this. And I'll get this term right here and this term here. And I can use the equations to rewrite. I can write this in terms of the my system of differential equations this way. So I get d mu is. Uh, delta, where delta is this expression, this two form right here, plus alpha times mu. Okay. And likewise, I can calculate now the derivative of, of its derivative to be this. And now here's the lower degree conservation law right here. It's this form differentiated with respect to y times this form with total y derivative. And if I calculate the exterior derivative of that, I get <clears throat> this expression right here, so that on solutions to the equation, so when delta equals zero and its derivatives are equal to zero, this vanishes. So here's a conserved form, for, uh, a, conserv a conserved three form for the Frobenius integrability conditions. And in foliation theory, this conserve conservation law is well known. It's the so-called Gobi-Alve form associated to a foliation. Okay. So I'm running out of time. Uh, can I have just like five more minutes? Sure. sure. Okay. So we've talked about and put in our bicomplex again. 
We've talked about classical conservation laws here. We've talked about lower degree conservation laws here. These are plentiful. It doesn't happen very often that these exist, but we've talked about the machinery that you can use in order to calculate these lower degree conservation laws. And now we could go in the opposite direction and ask what about a conservation law in this block? Well, here's what the definition of it might be. So this would be a conserve, I would call this a conserved Lagrangian. So it's a top dimensional form and uh, it has the property that it's not a divergence, but it is a divergence modulo the equations that you're studying, okay? What does this mean? Well, this will mean that if you take lambda and you integrate it over your entire manifold, then this integral over the entire manifold would be zero. And these kinds of conservation laws are, appear also in a variety of differential geometry problems, okay? And the first one, <clears throat> one that got me interested in this is the so-called prescribed curvature problem on the two sphere. So you have your two sphere and you're gonna let K be a, a smooth function from the two sphere into R. And this is a given function. And what you want to know is, is there a um, metric on the two sphere? So we can write that metric as a, uh, conformal scaling of the standard metric, is there a metric on the two sphere whose Gaussian curvature is the function K? And so this is the differential equation you have to solve, okay? And so it's the Laplacian of, of U equals one minus K times E to the two U. And the problem is given K, can you solve this equation globally for, for you, okay? And um, Bourguignon even proves that uh, if X is a conformal killing vector field, then this expression right here is a conserved Lagrangian. That is to say, if I integrate this expression over the two sphere, then this expression has to be equal to zero if x and k can satisfy, this is the derivative of k, if x, if u and k can be chosen, uh, chosen to solve this differential equation. So if you pick your favorite test function and you do this integral uh, and you don't get zero, then you don't have a conservation law. Then you don't have a solution to that equation, okay? Another example, might be familiar to people is the following. Uh, a one form on a manifold is called harmonic if it satisfies, here's the equation for, for you to be a harmonic one form. For this harmonic one form equation, you do get this um, conserved Lagrangian, which I've written down right here. So by virtue of, of the harmonic equation, this expression can be written as a divergence. So lambda is d omega plus zero. And therefore, um, this integral on solutions has to be zero. Okay. But then you look at this integral and you say, well, this piece is positive. And if we have a Romani metric, then this term is positive, this term is positive. And so the only way this integral could be zero is if uh, this U has vanishing derivative, and so there's no harmonic forms. So that's kind of a, a Bachner type theorem in differential geometry. And the essence of it can be expressed in terms of what I'm calling con conserved uh, Lagrangians. Okay? I don't have much of a theory on how you calculate for a given system of differential equations the conserved Lagrangians, but I did. So the, at the time that, uh, a long time ago, when people were studying this prescribed curvature problem, they knew that these conditions were necessary uh, for, their, for K to admit a solution to this, for there to be a solution to this equation. But they wanted to know if there were other possible conserved Lagrangians for this prescribed curvature problem. And so I set up, I set up the problem, it was pretty hard to solve. And I was able to show that no, Unfortunately, the only 
conserved Lagrangians for um, the prescribed curvature problems were precisely these, the ones that people already already knew. Okay, I think. Yeah, I think that brings brings me to the end. So uh, there's lots of other topics that are very important to the study of conservation laws. Lax pairs for integral systems. Uh, integral invariance are another type of conservation law. Uh, the question of linearized st stability for a system of partial differential equations has to do with conservation laws. And I briefly mentioned that this whole subject can be studied from the um, differential forms, exterior differential systems approach, where it's called characteristic cohomology. So I think that's uh, that's it, it for today. I think the takeaway here is that studying conservation laws, there's a lot of possibilities. Uh, and so the subject's much more diverse and varied than the calculation of, of, of symmetries. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks very much.